joining us. So just to set the context, uh, India is set to become the third largest economy by 2030 and has a population which is young, digitally connected and ready for evolving technologies like the metaverse. And according to reports, around 80% of Indians are very enthusiastic about it, which is higher than the global average. And you know, we have eminent panelists joining us for this, for sharing their insights into this discussion. So I would request uh, to them to introduce themselves and just brief the audience for the work they are doing. Maybe I go first. Uh, hello everyone, absolute pleasure to be here. This is Utsav Mathur. I'm the founder and CEO at Geometry. Uh, we work at the intersection of the metaverse and AI uh, with essentially virtual worlds that create themselves based on the outcome. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been working with several large enterprises like Amazon, Big Basket, Bosch, Diageo, Avondale, just to name a few of our clients. Uh, working with enterprise to bring their metaverse uh, dreams to reality using our no-code, no-code platform. Uh, I'm Rajesh Virjantar, uh, co-founder and MD and CEO of KII. Uh, we are a company that's into banking solutions, uh, basically heading the entire rails for banks, right from core, tech tech solutions and digital banking. Uh, we recently launched Bharat Meta, our uh, platform for the metaverse. And that's how you know I, I got a space to be on the panel here. Given the context of what we're doing, uh, the whole idea is to enable uh, a Web3 based uh, metaverse, but if you look at current banking uh, in India, our endeavor is to make sure that we transition from the Web 2 to Web 3 over time. Hi everyone, uh, this is Ravi Krishnan. I lead a few product functions at Flipkart, uh, one of them being Flipkart Labs. And uh, we've done a bunch of work uh, in the metaverse space, uh, 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 and uh, that's probably the reason I'm here. Uh, so uh, Flipkart Labs, the mandate of Flipkart Labs is to look at uh, technologies which have not yet found mass PMF. And when we say mass PMF at Flipkart, we mean hundreds of millions of customers, but uh, have the potential to disrupt the future of commerce in the country. right? Uh, so those are the kind of technologies that we see early bits with the thesis around how do you achieve PMF or how do you accelerate PMF and monetization through these technologies faster than what they would have normally happened, right? So Metaverse is one of our focus areas. Uh, we'll talk more about it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aditya Mani. I'm the founder of an app called uh, Yologram Style. And basically what we do is uh, we allow you to try on clothing on e-commerce on an avatar of yours. And we're kind of building the end-to-end -end experience. So we're starting right from, you know, seeing a 3D jacket in your space, seeing it on an avatar, which could be a branded brand ambassador. So for example, a Virat Kohli or a Meer Singh, you, you would be able to see that jacket on them. You can even digitize your family members. You could see it on, on them. And that's where the try economy ends, but we, we are taking it beyond that. So we're saying that uh, you can save uh, clothing onto your avatars. You can pay to have that as an NFT. You can take it into a gaming. So we're also working on interoperable avatars where uh, your avatar can go in from one metaverse to another into games. And we feel that's where the end-to-end -end kind of uh, linkage of the metaverse in terms of identity embodiment will really start to work. So you know, what happens is today most metaverses are like activations. You do it and you forget about it. But if you have a kind of a you know identity which relates to you and an avatar which is uh, which is which resembles you and you have some kind of like likeness to it. Perhaps you will probably want to use that in different places, and perhaps you'd want to style that with branded clothing. So that's the thesis of what we're building. So very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, sorry, I could not be there in person today, uh, but it's uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this panel. Uh, so I'm Mukundar Goindraj at the uh, practice head for uh, digital twins and generative AI at NVIDIA for APAC. Uh, prior to this, I was working with Boston Consulting Group. So I was uh, heading the metaverse and digital twin for APAC. Uh, so today, I'm sure you all uh, are already excited about the, the two most interesting topic, uh, generative AI and uh, digital metaverse. And I, I feel uh, gifted to be part of um, working in this space and uh, Creating some success stories with our customers. I'm looking forward to sharing more insights. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, to begin with, I have a common question for all of you. Is India demographically well positioned to contribute to the digital labor of metaverse? 
given it's the fourth destination for IT offshoring globally. Uh, who would like to take this first? Uh, yeah, I think you know India is well positioned for a lot of things, and I think we feel uh, this is definitely from the terms of skills, right, that are required for it. Uh, I actually want to use this to also answer what I feel is a skill that we don't necessarily talk about, which is the skill of doing stuff in three dimensions, right? Uh, at Geometry, we hire a workforce that is not very common. Uh, for a lot of other technology companies to hire, which is architects, right? And one of the things I want to say is actually India produces some amazing uh, students of design as well. Of late, I think that infrastructure has evolved a lot. We hear a lot, of course, about what our technology institutions are doing. They're doing an amazing job of bringing the workforce up. We all know that story. We're doing phenomenally well. We have a lot of workforce from the, uh, you know, from the IT, BPO industry, who of course are looking for some amazing roles. I think on that front, we're all well aware. But I think we also have a really upcoming design force. Uh, and I think it's also a time where India gets to enforce its sense of design. I think somewhere we lost uh, an Indian sense of design on a global scale, right? As a designer, I'm, I'm an architect by training myself, which is why this is slightly more personal to me. But I think that, you know, as India, we were always, we always had a very unique sense of design. Uh, whether it's through history, through our buildings, through our architecture, and somewhere along the way in this entire digitization process, we lost that. So I think we definitely are in the right place from a technology standpoint, which I'll let the others add to. Uh, but I think from a design standpoint, I think we've been more, we're more ready than ever. So uh, taking it forward from what Utsav said, uh, we do have the skills with, uh, in terms of uh, technology. Uh, importantly, also, if you look at India as a country, We've actually taught the world about digital payments. Uh, there are a few lessons that we said of how online payments can be done at a low cost. Uh, and of course, Chandrayaan has proven that about space as well. So given that experience, I think uh, there's a lot that India can do to not just uh, provide the skills to uh, create metaverse uh, assets, etc., but also to make sure that we can advise countries how to use the metaverse effectively. Uh, and sort of one, prep the demand for Metaverse, and two, importantly, uh, utilize different type of services on it. So I think there are, uh, if you look at the Indian ecosystem per se, uh, the India stack, uh, Aadhaar and, uh, you know, UPI, and now the CBDC stack, is going to be an interesting one, uh, and when the Metaverse starts utilizing that, uh, it will be a lesson for most of the people outside India, uh, most economies, on what would be the use cases that could go on. If you look at also the technology adoption within India, uh, whether it is at the urban population, but importantly at a rural scale, the ability to sort of take on uh, the metaverse in rural is an opportunity that India will also bring forward. Uh, that's something that we are endeavoring to do as a company. And those are, I think, the important lessons that can be uh, told to the world rather than just the outsourcing thing. Yeah, I think uh, definitely India is well poised. Uh, uh, one data point and one experience I'll share. Uh, I think you spoke about the fact that uh, it, it is a much younger demographic, right? Uh, I think almost 27% uh, of our workforce in the next year or two will actually be Gen Z or younger, right, in India. So I think uh, this generation is the one which has grown up on uh, uh, metaverse or experiences which are more immersive in nature, right? Uh, so definitely there is a demographic dividend. Uh, I'll give an anecdote on top of this, right? Uh, so as part of uh, labs in the larger Web3 thesis that we have, uh, we have a, a center of excellence partnership with uh, Polygon, uh, where we look to build the Web3 ecosystem in the country, not just by incubating uh, pilots on Flipkart, but also a lot of work in the developer community, right? So we host some of these uh, developer events and connects uh, uh, in the Web3 space in Bangalore. Uh, I remember the last one I think which I attended was in November. Uh, uh, we have a large training room at Flipkart, right, which can host like hundreds of folks. Typically, the only time I've, time I've seen it full is when we have all hands, right, where you call the entire Flipkart audience. I think the last general connect was the only other time I saw that room full, right. Uh, uh, we practically had hundreds of uh, 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 people who are interested in uh, developing in the Web3 space who attended a bunch of events, participated in a lot of the uh, developer connects, etc. that we host. Uh, everyone ranging from college students, which was a significant population in that group, uh, towards uh, corporate uh, folks working in the industry, right? Uh, 
Uh, so we had a very good mix and a very evolved thought process on building on Web3, right? It's not just attending out of curiosity, right? When you interact with them. So I think uh, uh, the workspace is already a lot more evolved than probably we give credit for, uh, right? Uh, in terms of being ready to lead the Web3 overall and metaverse uh, uh, revolution globally. Yeah, uh, I tend to agree as well. So from the, uh, you know, if, if you were to just look at Web2, if you were to look at how things work, uh, two of the biggest uh, revolutions which have kind of changed the way commerce happened have kind of ev uh, evolved out of India. So if you look at both Geo and Flipkart, both these things are completely made in India. So the, the basic stack exists. Now if you were to look at how it looks at in from the metaverse's angle, metaverse, the content creation can either come from the 3D industry, which is kind of an offshoot of VFX and you will not know how much of VFX comes to India. It's not just the VFX that comes to Hyderabad. Huge amounts of D9 work comes to Bombay, comes to so many places and we don't even know about it. So major Hollywood blockbusters are all post-produced in a large amount in India. So that con that talent pool exists, that talent pool can be, you know, diverted to the metaverse. And also what, uh, you know, Ravi said that uh, the, the next generation coming to work is adopting this in their daily work. So, you know, they have kind of grown up on iPads, so they know the value of this. And um, moving on from an ownership point of view, so we have India Stack, we've got UPI, we've got the uh, the solid foundations. So the CBDC is is coming up with a sandbox. Uh, I know uh, Rajesh's team is working on that. But we've had Polygon come out of India. We've had so many of the in interesting blockchain companies come out of India. And uh, the fact that you know they've done anything possible to stay alive, whether it means you know, shifting out till the regulations are sorted out. So from the entire end-to-end -end, uh, perspective, we've got the right kind of talent pool, as well as the uh, motivated entrepreneurs who are willing to stick their guns and, you know, stay, stay with this. So I feel, I mean, even from an AI perspective, so content could be disrupted by AI, but just look at how well India has responded to Sam Altman's challenge. So Mr. Mukesh Ambani has come up, come up with a challenge. So we don't know how good it is, but the fact is, Bharshini is coming up, uh, Reliance is coming up with their AI, uh, uh, the Ola team is coming up with their AI. So everyone is responding back with their unicorns where we can say that we can come up with a homegrown AI which will probably do our faces better, which will probably do our culture better, which will understand perspective. So I really think that we have a good end-to-end -end, uh, you know, framework or a you know, basement in place to build that uh, big building. Yeah, all great points. Uh, just to add on top of it, right? So the major shift that we are seeing, right? So uh, India has always been the largest exporter of softwares, to be honest, in the world, right? In the last few years, the shift is already happening where we are also becoming one of the largest consumer of these technologies. So the consumer market is increasing heavily. So this automatically takes us to the the core requirement, which is setting up the infra for the generative AI and uh, the industrial metaverse that we are talking about. Uh, we are looking at least of investment of 40,000 crores in the next few quarters. And uh, we have recently seen, like there was a press release from Lens, like last evening, where they invested 1.25 billion dollars just for setting up the intra for uh, you know, generative AI and metaverse. And all of this happened in India and this can be consumed by the startups. Instead of just relying on the CSPs to run all these workloads, we can get a, a, a more value for money if it is uh, you know, presented in the Indian market, in Indian companies. So that's the uh, part where we are moving towards. Our government, uh, central government is really committed to this. And we have uh, companies like Reliance, the Tata Group, which includes PCL and TCS, who are also investing heavily in this area. Right, so with great talent pool, which I think uh, we already have at the right intro, and we would be uh, pretty well set to you know achieve a uh, uh, great uh, heights. Thank you, Ravi. With respect to metaverse and e-commerce, how do you expect the space to go, and what more can we expect from that? Yeah, so I think uh, you spoke about it when you started, right? 80% uh, of Indians uh, are excited about the metaverse. Uh, yeah, I just could land a couple more commerce related data points to that. Uh, there were a couple of surveys by Google McKinsey uh, that, that, that 
who did the survey doesn't matter. But I think if you look at people who are expecting to use uh, immersive visualization of products when they are making purchases, more than 50% of uh, Indians already are willing or look forward to using things like a uh, try-on when you're buying a skincare product or visualizing 3D or visualize uh, in your space right, when you're buying uh, a furniture product or an appliance. Right? Uh, uh, so multiple surveys have anywhere between 45 to 55 percent of Indians are already looking forward to those experiences. right? Uh, and we've seen that play out on Flipkart. I think uh, uh, the way I look at uh, Metaverse for commerce, uh, uh, it's about uh, better visualization of products to make a more informed shopping choice as the first stage. The second stage is where the entire shopping experience gets a lot more fun right, and a lot more interactive. Uh, so the first stage is, I think is very important. If you're not able to add a value to the core commerce journey, uh, uh, there is no point of just doing something uh, for engagement. right? Uh, so our thesis has been based on helping customers first visualize products better and then looking at uh, uh, the entire uh, experience being on the metaverse. right? So we've invested a lot in visualized products in 3D, visualized products in your room, uh, try-ons for uh, beauty products, try-on for apparel products, uh, skin analyzer for beauty products where you can get recommendations based on an AR experience or based on your skin type and your preferences, what works best for you. Right? Uh, bunch of those products are already live on Flipkart today. And what we've seen is in high involvement categories, right? uh, uh, more than 40 to 50 percent of between 40 to 50 percent of shoppers actually engage. People who end up buying actually engage in these experiences when they are available. Right? And the engagement times are very strong. Uh, it has a direct correlation to commerce metrics. Right? Uh, people who engage uh, convert better, are less inclined to return products later, right? So it's adding value to the commerce journey. So I think that's the first area of focus for us, right? Uh, where we've actually seen that better product visualization adds value to the commerce journey. Uh, we've also taken it forward. We have uh, launched something called as virtual worlds, right? Over the last couple of years, we have done a, a few explorations in that. Uh, our flagship virtual world of metaverse is uh, something called as the Flipverse, which we uh, have launched during the festive season, the big billion days and beyond. Uh, in the last couple of years, right, and we have tried a few variations of it, and we have seen very strong user engagement in those properties where uh, you know use it as a mechanism for users to come shop, discover brands, discover deals, uh, do interesting activities, challenges within the space, etc. Get rewarded for it. Uh, very strong engagement uh, 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 on those properties. Uh, more than a million users have engaged just last year on some of these. We have also launched uh, brand-specific uh, worlds, right, uh, where uh, multiple brands, Coco, Monterey's. Uh, Coca-Cola, right? They have all kind of uh, launch experiences where users can engage with a brand in different ways, right? It could be anything from uh, a virtual showroom of sort where you are able to kind of browse, explore products, get details of products to something more immersive like, uh, uh, you know, uh, participate in a brand uh, history or a heritage journey uh, in a metaverse kind of experience, right? So, uh, again, we have seen very strong engagement metrics on some of these. Uh, so, it's early days. I think what's important is first we need to add value to the customer shopping journey. And on top of that, how do you build experiences which are immersive, right? That's the two phases. I think the future of uh, commerce uh, will look a lot different in the next five to seven years. It's very difficult to pick out how exactly it will look like. But uh, definitely, these experiences will uh, take a higher share of the shopper journey, right? Uh, in terms of time spent, in terms of commerce share, etc. for sure. Uh, and it will definitely uh, become one of one, a new finding method, right? Uh, in terms of how people shop online. So, uh, very excited about the thesis. Uh, we'll have to continue exploring to figure out that product market fit. Right? Uh, that's the way I look at it. So you said around 40 to 50 percent engaged uh, this area. So I just want to understand uh, post you have added these features, has the overall uh, customer engagement increased? Yeah, uh, definitely. Right. Uh, uh, what we've seen is uh, uh, the time spent on the platform as well as uh, conversion. Right. Uh, uh, have been higher. Once people engage with these properties versus other ones, right? So again, it's early days, uh, but yes, the initial metrics are very strong. And you also said that the return uh, product returns are lesser. So if you can just yeah, so if you're able to uh, let's take apparel try on as an example, right? If you're able to visualize, uh, you know, this is how the product looks uh, on a body of my dimension, right? So our product apparel visualize a try on feature also allows you to kind of give your body your height, your weight, all of those dimensions and visualize the product in a certain size, small, medium, large on that body type and what is perfect for you, what is loose, what is tight, right? Uh, obviously, when you visualize it in that manner, you make a more informed choice, right? And that results in uh, better alignment when you act, the actual product gets delivered, right? So that's, that's that simple. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Aditya, so what is the opportunity in digital fashion and updates? Yeah, so 
Uh, avatars are like you know how we have uh, you know the Sanskrit word it's basically an embodiment, and uh, it's important to understand where the promise of the metaverse is. The promise of the metaverse is there that you know uh, if I go to a Justin Bieber concert, I can see a jacket on Justin Bieber, and then I can call my friend who lives in LA and I'm in Delhi, and we can virtually be present in the same concert, and we can both have. Jackets with our names written on under the back, and that's a digital. So that's the promise of the metaverse, and then we can take that jacket into Roblox or something. So that's the end-to-end -end vision. But in order to get there, we have to build on it. We have to build towards that. And uh, you know, a, a good place, a good destination where something like this can happen is where the brands and the consumers tend to coexist, and that's e-commerce. So in the e-commerce side, we have the pre-pre-visualization, which is e-commerce. But it's important to understand where the value lies. The value. Is being brought in over there for the vendor. The value is being brought in over there for the brand. So it's very important not to distract the consumer to be present and just playing around there and taking away from the sale. So when you're building a try-on experience, then the entire, you know, the entire avatar and the entire digital fashion should kind of take you towards a sale, which is a physical sale. So right now most brands are not looking at digital sales. Although, you know, IKEA does want that, you know, if you buy a physical IKEA, you should be thinking about digital IKEA in your, um, in, in, your, in your home space that you design because they have to rebuild their brand equity there because, you know, you, it's again, a, it's a level playing field. So IKEA wants to be in that thought leadership to say that when you're building your metaverse, make sure you think, of, think about a branded experience for your metaverse. So on the try on side, it's very important to think about the brand and the retailer and it's not a distraction. One good place where the metaverse can be a place of engagement is where you are thinking for the brand and you are saying that, okay, fine, let us make it a destination. So, you know, if I can, if for example, I can connect with a friend of mine in New York and I'm present in Delhi and we can go into the Gucci store in Milan. So, I unfortunately can't afford Gucci, but I'm just giving an example and we can actually go and visualize how things look. And we are having a conversation and we are doing things and we are joking around, putting things and this is a private space. This may not be with you know, people walking around like the decent and love. That's actual value and I am starting to look at that destination as a place to meet my friend, as a place to... So think about, uh, you know, girls, they tend to meet and they go shopping together. Sometimes it's not possible when you are distributed across the globe. It's not possible to use the screen share on different time zones. So, you know, here's an experience where you can just go in, be present and the, the thing is that your moment of truth and when you become a believer is when you put on a VR headset. Because when you put on a VR headset, it's like watching a Pixar movie. You forget that it's a cartoon. You forget about the textures. You don't go into the experience. So, you know, very often when you see a Pixar movie, you have tears rolling down your cheeks because it's the real emotion. It's the real feeling that you go into. You don't keep saying, oh, this is Good a cartoon, this is a cartoon. I don't believe this. You go into the story. The same thing happens in these experiences. So. From avatars have a very important part there, so you can visualize it on your brand, you can see the brand, and it has to be digital, so you can just, you know, change things on the fly. Then, of course, lies the whole ownership experience. So, you know, can I see Tiger Woods doing a swing of a Callaway shirt, or can I see Sachin doing a, you know, a cricket swing of a Adidas? I don't know which brand is it, but you know, uh, that kind of experience. And then I feel the need to buy that digitally. That's where the metaverse and the promises of metaverse and what I said earlier, that can I save this to my wallet, can I take it into a game or a metaverse or a Zoom call where I can wear a digital uh, chair, a digital collectible which is either signed by Sachin or everyone knows this is Sachin jacket but I have my name on it. So all of this is enabled with digital fashion, all of this can be made possible with interoperable avatars and we believe this will happen especially with the way you know our Prime Minister is thinking about Esports being a place for us to get an Olympic medal. He talks about PUBG, he knows about the importance of how these industries have made a difference to both Japan and uh, Korea. And he knows that investment can come in because talent lies in here. And we know that you know, Gen Z is, the, is, is a crazy adopter. They will not wait for anyone, they will just play with things. So, assuming the way things are going, I think uh, you know, avatars and digital fashion have a, have a long. Uh, long way to go and I feel that there is uh, untapped uh, digital revenue available which the brands need to rediscover themselves as thought leaders in the digital space as well. Thank you. Uh, it looks like you helped the nice create their uh, conduct their ATM on Metaverse. Uh, when I first saw that I was truly impressed like how this is happening. So can that be a new trend? 
yes, I think the Reliance HDM has been, uh, well, you know, one of our very cool deployments, at least one that got a lot of my bones in. Uh, ever since that, of course, uh, we've also worked with Kotak Bank. Uh, we actually won a Brandon Hall Gold Award for having 35,000 people in the same space. Uh, you know, in a way, was just to talk about, uh, you know, for a virtual event that we've done for them. Uh, and I think one thing where I want to commend on, I think my work has largely been focused on making this less of a trend and more of something that starts to add value. And I think over there, one very essential part to uh, decide, I, I, I jumped into this industry in 2017. I, it was called the VR industry, it became VR, SAT, AR, became XR, became Metaverse. Now we're talking about spatial computing. Right? So everything's going to change and it's going to Already talk about Metaverse and AI. We're going to start branding ourselves spatial computing. Apple's trying to push that. So these are trends. These are essentially things that are there to generate excitement. But beyond this excitement, I think there's a larger vision of the next computing device. I think for the largest time, it's very important to consider this, that we have had paper as the primary mode of information dissemination. Just 10 years ago, files used to be moved, we had uh, physical paperwork pretty much everywhere, and then screens came and took everything over. Now, my primary mode of information dissemination is a two-dimensional screen. We have people joining in here on a screen. I consume all my information on my pocket screen, my mobile phone. I communicate through that in most of my meetings on screens. So screens are the next thing that has pretty much come in and what next, right? So data naturally is a very three-dimensional, it exists in our world. This space is generating data. Individuals are generating data. Objects in the 3D space are generating data. So as data breaks into the 3D world, it is but natural that the next computing devices will also be available. We saw Apple come up with a Vision Pro, uh, you know, uh, Request 3, of course, some amazing headsets coming up as well. Talk about what is going to be, and of course, if you have entrance to Geoglass, of course, a lot of other uh, initiatives like Gajima, which I think are really good uh, ways of helping this industry. What's happening is we're all talking about this eventual goal of how will we consume our information in the future, what's going to be the primary way of doing that. And I think my goal has been trying to work towards that as we end. But today, of course, we're limited by technology. Today, we have seen that evolution, of course, there's a few years to it. So we are going to, you know, get there eventually. Uh, uh, but in that meanwhile, what is the value that can be derived to us? I think that value uh, and, and feeling ourselves out of these trends and being more focused towards what comes out. What was most exciting about me for, for the Reliance project was not the fact that they did the AGM with us one time, they did their quarterly results and the second AGM with us. And that means we added some value to the way in which we were presenting that content. And I think again, you know, with that in mind, I have a lot of other less known deployments which are helping train, for example, all Reliance brand uh, employees across the country. I think those are the deployments where we're continuing to add continuous value, and those are also pretty exciting for us. So uh, I think that's a really important thing to take into account. Thank you. Uh, moving to Yubandar, uh, can you tell uh, like what are your expectations for the future of industrial metaverse? Great. Uh, <clears throat> Before I take that question, right, I just wanted to add one point to what Ravi called out about pre-visualizing things before you actually consume it. Because I had a very interesting experience uh, three days back. I was on my food hydrogen ordering app and uh, pretty much I always thought like what goes into the the food, right? What goes into, what are the ingredients it's going to uh, have and how do you customize it? So this uh, food ordering app let me try that in person which means I could just uh, choose the, the food which I am planning to order, click on the table, and then the actual size of the food appears. So one, the, portion, the actual portion of the food, what I was ordering was pizza. So it showed me a food as a 10 inch pizza going to be to be black. And uh, I could add some more topics on, uh, on it. And all of that was happening in real time on this app. And this was wonderful, right? So I, I feel that when there is an actual use for it, people will start uh, you know, using these features and probably solving some of their problems. So I love Italian food chips, but just doesn't, that doesn't mean that I know all the names of the foods out there, right? And most of them are Italian names, and it took me a while to understand what it is by Googling. But with this uh, feature, what I all I can do is click on the food option, show it on air, and it actually shows is it rice-based or noodle-based, or it's just uh, flour-based and things like that. Um, coming back to my question uh, that you have put across, 
uh, we have a say when we uh, talk to customers, right? So anything that moves in in your factory or around you can be automated, and anything that can be automated can be trained using AI. So this is the mantra that we are living in, and we are seeing uh, most of the customers that who are adopting in this space. And uh, and most digital twins, which we talk about today, uh, they pretty much stop with the pre-visualization setup. A big example is. Uh, before you go and buy a flat, you get a, a, a walkthrough of it through a, a 3D platform. And then most of the experience stops with that. Once you buy the flat, that's it. The whole 3D efforts or whatever you have gone in is completely discarded. Now imagine if we take that setup and provide a service on top of it, it's for your interior design. So the 3D layout is already there in place. And that can be customized by the customer as per this space and use it for this interior design. And later, this whole 3D asset can be used for the maintenance of your entire uh, your uh, building itself. And this is something which is picking up in big phase. Imagine you do this for a, a factory with probably thousand more complexities. So some of the workloads that we have seen huge impact is on the synthetic data generation. So. We are in, uh, and all of you are in Bangalore today. If you had been at the uh, Bangalore airport, I can very uh, uh, strongly say that we are under AI surveillance. So if you are just roaming around, loitering around for more than 15 minutes, automatically the message is going to go out to the, uh, the authorities and you will be escorted. Any suspicious activity are tracked completely in the airport today. And this is purely working based on AI stack, which has already been deployed at scale. Just deploying at scale is a big uh, thing because most of the experiments of emerging technologies happens in a, a lab and later it is uh, tested with uh, uh, a smaller group of audience. So when it comes to scalability, that is where most of these technologies suffer. So it's always super important to build a scalable uh, path, of course, uh, during the course in order for this uh, technology to be successful. I'm, I'm a great believer of here. I've been using that uh, since the DK, uh, DK1 of Oculus Rift. And all, I always felt and I always believed in this technology even today. But the only big challenge that it's facing is how do you put a, a headset in every individual on this planet? Today, the adoption has have already happened from, you know, in, to a smartphone, which is your primary mode of consuming content. Now, it's going to probably uh, uh, expect an even bigger disruption, which I believe is going to be more than the Apple Vision Pro, which is, it is required to put a headset or a gadget that we have seen in uh, all these fantasy movies to happen in real world, where a hologram can be your means of communication. That's uh, a far way, far, far apart from where we are today, but that's the future, right? So some of the workloads where we have seen huge trends, as I told you this, one of the synthetic data generation for the AI to work super efficient, you need to generate data. Collecting those data in the real world is going to consume time and machine time. Because data annotation is a, one of the biggest uh, uh, job where 200, 300 people have to work, cleaning up the data, manually annotate, and then use it to train. Now with synthetic data generation, you already have the 3D world, which is physically accurate and photo realistic. You use that world to generate data it can be all sort of hypothetical data, and then you use that to train your AI to be super efficient. This is one of the biggest workloads which is happening today in the industrial networks. The second bit, whatever that moves, right, with support of generative AI and the 3D work that you already built, you can train it. It could be a robot, it could be an AMR bot, or it could be a manipulation bot, it doesn't matter. With AI and with the right training grounds, you can actually write uh, ROS2 codes where you pretty much don't have to write a single line. You just give the inputs, the generative AI spits out the ROS2 code, you just take that code, deploy it to the robot, and it start acting today. And all of this is not the future, this is happening today. We are only talking about how this can be adopted across all industries, and while the adoption is happening, if they can also taste an, uh, an ROI, and that's what is going to stay uh, as the fuel for it for mass adoption. Thank you. Uh, Rajiv, uh, 
Could you please share how banks are leveraging the space currently and on why, uh, more on why they should? So, um, you know, being in the business of banking solutions, uh, we, we have rolled out two uh, metaverse spaces for banks. And banks in India are without their own virtual lounge and then stepping into account services and other factors as well as with banks. One of the core reasons why I believe that uh, banks per se and financial services firms need to look at the metaverse as an option uh, more so from a perspective of you know, three aspects. One is the use of generative AI and uh, uh, as we rightly said, you know, data is something that clearly drives AI. If you look at uh, what banks have as a wealth uh, today, it is not just the customer's wealth but also the customer's data. I think that's an industry that really uh, has the most data and most know how of what their customer is. Uh, so, the use of that generative way could be put to better uh, utility on the metaverse. Second part is when we look at digital banking today, uh, it has created a distance from a perspective of not being so personalized. Uh, when we look at hyper personalization within digital banking, uh, the solution that was thought about is to come out with a super app, for example. So you have a super app with uh, 400 functionalities. The concept of an app or a mobile app in the first place is the fact that it does not need a user manual to run. Uh, it has to have nine tiles, fourteen tiles, and make it as simple to run. And then give the choices as an option. But to be able to say that I will execute that with uh, running 400 tiles is going to be difficult. Now given that perspective, I think that again builds the perfect use case for the metaverse where uh, you can interact with another and then uh, highlight what choices you have. And the other can then constitute a, uh, or rather make a product that is suitable to the customer. So there is no perfect way in digital banking and mobile apps today or internet banking to really come out with other personalization. I think that is one more use case. Third one is with regards to banking per se. When we look at banking today and bank innovation in banking, most of that innovation has happened in the area of payments. So when we look at the whole aspect of fintech and uh, payments, not necessarily working to banks, like as we would have UPI licenses now coming up. Uh, the concept of banking being model has not really happened in that sense. When we look at either the change in technology, whether it is with regards to adoption of what Web3 brought forward, what blockchain brought forward, uh, and, and various other such so-called trends that have happened in the industry. I think uh, the metaverse provides that perfect opportunity for the banks to create and use avatars, use the large amount of data that they have, uh, utilize and leverage technology like generative AI, and service the customer with hyper-personalized products. So that's typically how we really approach this area. Uh, the other part is with regards to the graduation of the whole movement of metaverse into IoT. That's going to change the landscape of how industries will uh, operate cross-functionally between each other. Uh, currently, I think one of the pitfalls of the metaverse as a concept is that interoperability is a big question. But if that was to improve with uh, open APIs and open banking going to open finance to open economy, uh, I truly believe that that full shift to open economy can be driven by the metaverse and the technology. So I think those are the driving factors why banks should and will look at uh, metaverse as an area or a channel. Thank you. Uh, so. Quick closing statement by all of you on a statement of basically on a scale of 1 to 12, 10, how would you rank India's positioning in metaverse currently? Uh, to give numbers. So, that's, that's, yeah, do I have to justify it? No, I think there's a long, long way to go. Uh, we're, we're doing well. We have all the, the reason I give that relatively high number, I think it's on the higher side, is because we're well prepared. We're starting to, uh, you know, put steps in the right direction towards achieving this. But as I think was mentioned before, we are the largest consumer market, and we should therefore be setting the pace rather than following. I do think that in a fair for a fair amount of things, we are, uh, you know, still uh, looking outside. But we have all the right foundations in place. So uh, I think uh, you know, getting to that ten over the next two three years is something that I think. Uh, group here would be as well. I, I would put as three from a perspective of adoption, but I would put the yeah, exactly because you know you can make out with the amount of uh, 
commerce that's happening or activities that happen. But I think from a perspective of the potential, India does rank higher than any other economy, I would say, globally. Primarily because we have the entire digital brains in terms of the stack of, of artificial intelligence and other areas. So it's all about industries coming together and adopting new skills. So my three is on adoption and not on capability. Uh, on capability, I think India to be uh, Yeah, I would uh, give it a four. Uh, I think it's just about uh, there are so many other things that need to come together, right? I think it's important for while excitement is good, it's also important for us to stay grounded on. There is so much work to be done, right? Everything from hardware, interoperability, right? Mass adoption, all of those things that we have spoken today. The role of AI, right? I think uh, uh, I generally uh, believe that without AI, it's going to be difficult to scale. Uh, you will have to have AI in terms of everything from I think uh, we were discussing photogrammetry uh, as a technique earlier, right? Uh, it's an automated technique for generating uh, 3D visualization, right? Uh, there is a lot of work to be done uh, just so that we stay grounded. I think it's a four. So I also think from a capability angle, we are higher. I would say eight because you know we have, we've kind of immersed ourselves into gaming during the pandemic. We've done a lot of our digital purchases on time. On the you know during the pandemic, we had our entire vaccines. And so we're digital ready, and so from a capability, even the whole way a lot of the uh, blockchain startups they kind of evolved. They figured out a way of going to Dubai or whatever just to stay alive because they know that we haven't figured out the regulation yet. But from an actual use case point of view, I would say from a rollout point of view, everyone is at a four worldwide. I would say India, because of certain enthusiasts, we might be a little more. But four, four and a half, I would say worldwide. But I feel a lot of the kids today are on Minecraft and Roblox. So, you know, maybe two years from now, we'll be leading this place. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, it was that informative. So. <laughs> Quickly, yeah. keep it crisp. Uh, I think this was a lovely session here. Uh, myself, I'm Sai. I call myself Medasai because uh, we've been in this place for like four, 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 uh, three years now. So, uh, uh, the question, uh, especially like I think uh, we have pointed on the developments part. The question is more pointed on the user user adaption part. How to solve that? So uh, one thing, uh, the perspective shift has to happen. I feel, uh, but would love to know uh, your thoughts on it. Uh, especially like when we when we talk about metaverse and things, a VR headset is needed. But most of the metaverses, uh, uh, the uh, we, uh, there's no headset issue. Begin with. But how to solve this user adaption issue, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll love to hear your, your thoughts on So put it to the back. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh, the only way it will work is if you have true engagement uh, that is also sticky. I think most of the stuff that's happening right now does the follow. Right? Everyone's excited about it. Uh, you'll see higher engagement or anything you launch. But I think it's not sticky. So uh, the right way to do it is first engage. I think everyone's doing a good job with that. Uh, but how do you continue that engagement beyond the first login and beyond the second login? And how do you keep it sticky? Uh, stickiness can be simulated in a way or, or you know accelerated in a way by giving incentives. Right? So you keep playing this, I will give you discounts. But that is not too stickiness. We need a way for the person to come back and feel that I genuinely enjoyed myself so much that I want to be back there. Right? Which is happening in isolated groups and communities if you look online at VR chat, I mean, through headset, right? So that's already starting to happen in a lot of communities who are, you know, continuing to grow at uh, tremendous rates. But also outside of the headset in terms of Roblox, right? uh, Although I think uh, we are uh, going towards a uh, downward welcome also over there. But I think on Roblox, it's, I think, uh, you know, an amazing way of seeing uh, what is the value. I mean, just, it is so fun for kids. Uh, people are spending so much on Roblox in yes, India is the leading uh, population. So, that platform as well, right? And that's because that audience, which is, uh, you know, I think it peaks at 14, 16 years old, uh, a lot younger now than that, has a tremendous, uh, you know, has an amazing time to play those games, uh, pestering their parents to buy some of their coins. So I think it's it's about engagement and stickiness. Uh, that's what it was all about.